So I would like to uh, jump directly to the core of the things that we will be talking about. Uh, and in order to do that, I would like to start uh, with a kind of an exercise. And the meaning of this exercise will become clear uh, as I talk about what's happening there. So uh, sit comfortably. Uh, put yourself in a situation that you don't need to move. Uh, place your, uh, close your eyes. Uh, place your hands in a comfortable position. Uh, place your two feet on the ground. And like they tell you in yoga, feel that they are kind of rooted in the, in the ground. Uh, uh, okay. So uh, the first thing that uh, I would like to say is that uh, uh, when, when you just uh, close your eyes, it, uh, it seems that you are immediately, uh, instinctually kind of go inwardly. Uh, and this is not what uh, we're going to be looking for here. So the first thing that we will do in order to, uh, to dispel a little bit this thing, touch your hand with the other hand or touch any part of your body. Uh, and just feel how the fact that uh, this kind of sense of touch uh, takes you from a purely uh, inward position somewhere else. We'll see exactly uh, where it leads us. Uh, now, uh, touch your neighbor uh, on the shoulder, on the hand uh, for a little bit. Uh, and uh, <coughs> just think about the frame of mind that you have when you touch. Uh, uh, you are still completely isolated. You are not moving. Uh, you are really concentrated on a special kind of frame of mind, but you're not inward anymore. Uh, you are in a kind of a strange uh, space now uh, that is external to you, but, and you have to think of yourself now uh, as that you are kind of living in this world that is external to you, uh, a being among other beings. Because it's external, then this uh, state of mind can accommodate the, uh, the existence of other people. Uh, so just stick to, uh, to this point where you are quite isolated, but you are not in internally directed. You are kind of in some kind of a world, in like, let's say dark world, because your eyes are closed. But you feel very much that you are there somewhere, existing in some kind of a world. Uh, and this world allows other people to also be. So you are sharing this world with other being. Uh, so this, uh, and this idea that you kind of center yourself that way as a being among other being, uh, this is kind of the state of mind that uh, we want to, to get it. Uh, but now we have to think a little bit more what kind of a state of mind, uh, hap what happens when we think of ourselves really as being among other being. So, so, so you are in a very kind of a murky, state that uh, uh, is at the same time quite secure from the point of view nobody can tell you that you are not a being and you are touching somebody else and nobody can say that you are the only being and, and everybody is in space together but the fact that you are concentrated on such a, a bare concept or on such a naked concept of being uh, this represents some kind of an attitude. Merleau-Ponty begins by saying that uh, uh, this state of mind corresponds to thinking, I'm not a living being, a man, uh, not even consciousness, possessing all the characteristics that zoology, sociology, psychology, uh, or other sciences do. Rather, I am the absolute source. 
my existence does not come from my antecedents nor from my physical uh, and social surrounding. It moves out towards them and sustains them. For I am the one who brings into being for myself. Uh, so, uh, so the idea is that when you really try to get to this level that you appear to yourself uh, really uh, just as a being, you have to erase a lot of layers uh, that you are normally preoccupied with. And this erasure of all those levels, what it kind of leaves, uh, is something that instinctively resists the idea of a scientific uh, reduction. It's like saying, I'm not an object of science, I'm something else. Uh, now, another way of uh, looking at it, it's a little bit like the Cartesian cogito uh, that some of you might know. He was, uh, like in the meditation, Descartes describes situation very much like the one I'm in. He's, he's sitting in uh, a table lit by uh, a candle, and he begins to uh, doubt everything that he knows and all the connection that he normally uh, conceives of. Uh, and uh, he says that his senses might be uh, faulty and it might see things that do not exist. And then the, the cogito ergo sum, then they said, yes, but there's a thought going on here. Uh, and this is something that uh, cannot be denied, that some thought is, uh, is going on. And because the thought requires a thinker, then the moment that you have this certainty about the thought is going on, then you also have a certainty about yourself existing as the thinker of that thought. Uh, but this kind of argument leads you inwardly to some kind of an inner being. And that's not the state of mind that, uh, that we are looking for. Now, the cat has a second argument that is called dubito ergo sum. Uh, which means that the fact that I'm doubting everything, so the doubt itself already constitutes a proof of, the, uh, of your existence. But here, the doubt is not like a thought, like something that happens internally. Uh, doubting everything is like some kind of a state of mind, and the content of this state of mind uh, is that you can somehow unify everything uh, and doubt it. So here it's not so much the doubting that is the, what brings the proof on, but the fact that you doubt everything. So your ability to totalize and think of everything as one, uh, that it becomes the way that you begin to define yourself. And when you define yourself through this totalizing uh, ability, then you are no longer, it's not necessarily an inward state of mind, uh, but it's actually just about it, whenever uh, you are able to feel that you are part of a whole, uh, uh, you know, part of a world, and you can think of the entire world that way as a part of the world, then. Uh, then this totalizing force becomes the, uh, becomes the kernel or the core of your identity. And this does not necessarily mean inward identity because this uh, totalizing thing can actually, you can just uh, uh, experience everything and then think of the whole thing that you experience as like a one thing and then bracket it somehow doubt it, and as long as you can take it all as one, then you can approve your existence uh, of yourself in a slightly different way. That's kind of the route that Merleau-Ponty uh, takes, and he wants to get to a point that is really different than what he takes uh, to be like the tradition of the modern philosophy of Descartes and Kant that uh, found everything on the inner being and the thinker uh, of thought. Uh, now, uh, 
let's see. Uh, so, so where do you find yourself uh, in, in such a world? Uh, what kind of world do you find yourself in when you are doing this uh, uh, operation, let's say? So now let's think about it more like an operation that you are doing that now as you stay uh, in this frame of mind that you are conducting an operation and this operation will be like the core of the state of mind that uh, phenomenology uh, is talking about. So in some, in, in some people talk about it as a phenomenological reduction, that this is, uh, and there are many different uh, definitions of that, and there are many different ideas of what exactly happens uh, when you remove yourself from the ordinary world and take a possession uh, in this uh, twilight land as a being among other beings and very little else. Uh, so, uh, so some, some people are, are talking about it that you remove yourself from all the certainty of everyday existence. Uh, and another way of looking at it, that you denaturalize your thinking. That anything that you would normally think, you think a little bit differently. Another way of looking at it is kind of a Fremdung effect. In other words, to look at things from different, uh, from a new type of perspective uh, in order to gain uh, some kind of a fresh, immediate uh, experience of the things. Uh, then another way of looking at it is that you really try to stop thinking and more to like apply uh, some other mental uh, operation that are more, uh, let's say, spontaneous, uh, and they define themselves a little bit more vaguely, and you uh, try to analyze less, uh, and really try to get to the actual experience that you are having. So that's another thing that is like, uh, a little bit against uh, the intellect, against reason, and to at least temporarily replace it with some kind of, uh, of what, instinctive? Uh, it's a little bit hard to say exactly uh, what it is. And uh, uh, there's, there are lots of arguments about exactly the content of this uh, frame of mind that you are now at. Uh, and as a matter of fact, one need not uh, necessarily answer all the questions about it because one can really uh, spin it in different direction and people have uh, and do. Uh, and uh, maybe uh, there are different ways to do it. Maybe it's connected to what you want to get out of it. Uh, so we're not going to uh, get to an absolute definition of this uh, state of mind, but we are just going to uh, talk about different uh, aspects of it. Uh, okay, so another thing that he says, truth does not merely dwell in the inner man, or rather there is no inner man. Man is and towards the world, and it is in the world that he knows himself. When I return to myself from the dogmatism of common sense or of science, I do not find a source of intrinsic truth, but rather a subject destined to the world. This is uh, the idea. Uh, okay, so... Uh, there are also, another thing that is pretty clear is that there are different levels of this reduction or bracketing. Uh, the f one aspect is really uh, the automatization that you just kind of refuse to uh, go with the normal uh, process of life. Uh, let's see where it talks about that. Uh, the idea is that you just refuse. It's a kind of a refusal uh, to go along 
with the things that you're expected uh, to go on. And this kind of refusal for some people, this refusal um, is the most important aspect of it. To remove yourself from the concerns of everyday life uh, and to find yourself uh, a new kind of foundation that really presupposes as little as possible. But this kind of foundation allows other people and other objects to be part of the picture from the very beginning. And you don't need to actually prove yourself uh, inwardly or to prove the existence of others. Uh, this is uh, when you get to this level of a being among other beings, uh, you already actually have already all the things that a lot of philosophers feel that they have to prove. Uh, Monopoly says it's already there. You don't need to prove it. The main thing that you need to do is just to understand that you have the resources in a natural way uh, to do what the philosophers say that uh, you need to do through uh, philosophical and metaphysical argument. Uh, here, the state of mind, we don't need that stuff. Uh, we already have it, and what we need to, uh, to think about is to eliminate all the things that usually disturb us uh, from having this kind of very, very basic identity as a being among other beings. This is the point. So it's a question of like putting away layers uh, of things that disrupt you uh, from this foundation. Uh, and if you believe that this is a good foundation, then that will justify the operation of putting aside all the stuff that disturb you and disrupt you and doesn't allow you to see yourself in this light again as a being in a world that has other being and in this world you're already connected to other being in this world there is no categorical separation from one person to another, of one person to other objects there. There's some kind of a flow that goes from everything to everything else. And when you, the, the idea is to kind of accept this existence of flow and not to try to intellectualize it too quickly and to really put yourself as, uh, in this mode of existence where you more or less know whatever you need to know uh, before you even begin uh, the process of an intellectual uh, analysis. This is, the, this is the point. Now, the crux of the matter is that when you do that, uh, you actually... Uh, so, so the question is why would anybody want to do that, what it is good for, uh, we will get back to these things uh, later today and in uh, subsequent uh, lectures, but to, uh, to make a long story short, this type of uh, frame of mind is particularly important uh, in points where you feel that uh, your identity is somehow metaphysically damaged. And uh, you have to kind of take this idea of metaphysical damage to the personality. Uh, you have to take it quite seriously and quite metaphysically. Uh, in other words, uh, in, in a situation where you really don't appear to yourself as anything else but the reflection of uh, other things on you, and you can't, cannot find yourself in your own world. This is the point cannot find yourself in your own world. Uh, so uh, in periods, uh, usually, at least again, I uh, would uh, just introduce some ideas that will uh, come back uh, later on, maybe not today, uh, but the, the periods when uh, these kind of feelings become that you're metaphysically damaged. Uh, these become important uh, 
or, um, in, in a lot of different circumstances, but one of the circumstances uh, that this kind of feeling becomes strong is during periods of uh, technological revolution uh, that seems to kind of endanger the very sense of identity that you have uh, of yourself. Uh, and you, when you begin to really doubt the coherence of your uh, everyday life uh, because of this feeling that uh, uh, the latest technology is not something like uh, a hammer uh, that is something that is for you to use, uh, but it is something that uses you. That by using it, you become, it changes you. Uh, and by doing it, uh, it actually damages your ability to kind of center on your own existence as a being. And uh, so uh, now it sounds like uh, you, you can, of course, uh, try to formulate it in psychological terms. Uh, but in phenomenology, they really formulate it in metaphysical terms. In other words, it's not something like a neurosis that has to do with some kind of the rules of uh, psychology, uh, but, it's, but it is a metaphysical situation that really endangers uh, everything that you do and your basic relation uh, to the world. And the way to resolve it is to become a metaphysician, a philosopher. In other words, to bring yourself to this stage that we are trying to bring ourselves now uh, and to create for yourself a new foundation that is uh, uh, th that's what we are talking about and on the basis of this foundation uh, to build the rest of your life. Uh, this is, uh, what I'm saying is that in periods that people have this kind of feeling then the kind of state of mind that we are talking about, the phenomenological state of mind and the phenomenological reduction, uh, have a direct idea, concept for the solution. That's, uh, that's, the, that's the point. Uh, now, uh, there are, of course, even within the idea of uh, technological change, there are very different aspects. And, uh, Another uh, context where people really feel the need for this kind of uh, new metaphysical uh, uh, foundation, for example, there's a f feeling that uh, for whatever reason people are kind of brainwashed and they, what happens, all their mental uh, actions and all their mental attitudes are more or less uh, brought into them by some kind of a laws uh, that they don't really understand, that they're kind of seduced into th doing certain things and uh, or out of fear uh, or out of a uh, variety of uh, uh, human motivations uh, that uh, in, 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 in such a situation what the main thing that they need is some kind of a process of de-automatization, that this is part of it. Uh, first of all, to de-automatize and to kind of force yourself uh, to start without uh, relying on the uh, sources that you use normally in order to uh, make your decision. So that's another aspect of the uh, of the situation uh, and uh, and we will go back to uh, uh, to a different uh, like for example about different periods when this feeling was very strong for example before the first world war that was because uh, the cities were growing at the time like uh, most of the big cities like Vienna grew up uh, like four or five times in like 30 years. Like most of the big cities grew by a factor of three, four, five, sometimes seven. Uh, the density inside the city became unbearable. Uh, the issues of uh, crime became uh, uh, very different somehow. 
And uh, there was a, a sense that uh, people were kind of going uh, crazy a little bit because of, uh, you know, the life in the modern city. So this was like one period, actually, phenomenology started more or less in this period between the 1890s, let's say, uh, and the First World War. Like this was the first part of phenomenology and it responded uh, directly or indirectly to this feeling of uh, metaphysical damage. Um, in that sense, there's also an aspect of uh, anti-modernism in some of the phenomenologies because it's like a corrective to uh, the modern life. That's another aspect. Now, not everybody felt that way, but some did. For example, Heidegger famously uh, had the kind of a strong sense uh, of anti-modern. Did you want to say something? Ah, oh, no, OK. I thought you were raising your hand. Uh, but it's not necessary. It's not like all the, pheno the phenomenologists uh, agreed on that. Uh, but what they all agreed upon, and that's what we are doing here, is, this, uh, is the importance of, uh, of uh, intentionally bringing yourself to doubt whatever you can, uh, to stop like cooperating with the rules of everyday life, uh, to try to anchor yourself in very basic concept of being about your body, your place, uh, your, the, the impact of gravity, uh, the weight of things, how you move things around. Like this is like one way of like taking those very, uh, yeah? How much plays acceptance a role in, in acceptance in phenomenology? Phenomenology? Yeah. yeah. Acceptance of whom? Uh, for example, politics or what's going on? Uh, yeah, th this is the thing that, uh, this is politics, sociology, uh, this is one of the things you have to forget when you are doing it. Mm. Specifically, okay. this stuff, you have to really forget them. Uh, and you really try to put yourself in a space where they don't matter for a while. And you try to put them aside and really see what stays, what remains when you put this aside. Uh, and again, this is another uh, reason why some people gravitate towards uh, phenomenology because they feel that they are uh, surrounded by uh, various toxic ideologies that like warp their thinking and they don't let them, they kind of uh, they damage them somehow, their sense of identity. So one of the things you do is just put them aside and try to found a, a foundation that does not presuppose them. That's uh, one of the things that it's all good for, to neutralize yourself. Uh, a, another aspect is just the, the purifying uh, a force of saying no, you know, of refusal. That's another way of, uh, of looking at it. You know, they tell you to say yes, you just say no. Why? Because you can't say no. And, and when you do, you really immediately find yourself uh, in a position that you are kind of hold back and you are like already uh, found, uh, find uh, some kind of a perspective that allows you to look at the situation uh, uh, from a fuller uh, point of view and that it somehow bypasses a lot of things that uh, disturb you from having like a direct connection. That's, uh, uh, so when you say acceptance, uh, part of it is like, uh, it, it, it's not like every ideology is brainwashing. Sometimes people really convince themselves and give themselves arguments and so, uh, but, but even when they do, uh, when you are put yourself in the uh, in this phenomenological reduction state of mind, uh, you have to move back from them and to look for a wider perspective that somehow encompasses them. No. Um, okay, so the body uh, is a very important aspect uh, of the whole picture. Uh, the identity here, the I, is an em embodied I, incorporated I, an I that has already 
uh, not just the possibility of passively receiving, but also of uh, uh, changing position and uh, creating sensation at will, uh, and also uh, someone uh, that, uh, uh, that you, you know, uh, the body creates like inner state of mind and outer state of mind that are created the inner pain and outer pain. Inner pain is the kind of pain that's how Freud defined it, that, that uh, baby understands the difference between the inner and an outer uh, because when you have like a stomach pain and you move your position, it still remains. But if you have like a ray of light is, uh, uh, hits your eye, then by moving yourself, the pain stops. So, so there are all sorts of purely bodily ways of articulating the, the differences between inner state and outer state. Uh, but, the, but the idea that everything, every thought, every action, every state of mind uh, is an embodied state of mind, something that really has an uh, immediate relation to the body itself. So that's uh, another uh, a very important point here. Uh, and because of, of the emphasis uh, on the body, that also alleviates to some extent the problem of the other, because in like, um, for Descartes, for Kant, uh, for the idealistic philosophers who think in terms of uh, I as the thinker, so the existence of others is always a very uh, strange question because when you say there's a thought going on and you define yourself as the thinker, uh, the thought is only available and accessible to me. Uh, therefore, it cannot be something that anybody else uh, can have an access to. Uh, so the question is how do we ever know that there are other beings involved? This is kind of how uh, classical modern philosophy goes. Um, but when you think about the idea of an embodied self, um, then uh, the question does not arise, or at least it arises uh, very differently because we are all swimming in the same sea. So, and there's nothing above and beyond uh, the sea. So other people swim in the same sea, just in different locations at different times. Uh, and this is the basic furniture of the world, like these beings who kind of swim together uh, in the same sea. So, uh, which basically means that uh, there's got to be some form of communication uh, that is really does not uh, go, it is not completely subordinated to language uh, and does not, com is not completely subordinated to, but something that exists just in virtue of the fact that you are different being living uh, in the same space. Uh, so that already guarantees a certain level of communication and a certain level of understanding. Now, another thing that uh, should be said that another way of understanding this uh, idea uh, is to put it in stark contrast to romanticism because romanticism is based, the foundation, uh, it, you know, romanticism starts with Descartes and Kant and it is a kind of a frame of mind that uh, is about putting on a pedestal the inner eye and the inner eye that can think and invent things that uh, did not happen there before, and through this ability to think and dream things that are unreal uh, on some level, but they have the reality for the thinker. Uh, this is basically romanticism. So you put on the pedestal this ability of like living inwardly and like doing creations in that. Uh, uh, in that arena, let's say. And phenomenology is the diametric opposite. Uh, there is no inner eye, and any kind of creation, any creative act uh, of any kind 
uh, takes place in this world. So even if it involves some kind of uh, imaginative things and, uh, uh, and some things that are kind of maybe uh, delusions or uh, all sorts of stuff that is not available for others, just in virtue of the fact that uh, a poem is written on paper or whatever, and that music uh, creates uh, sounds that are available. So you write notes uh, according to an inward idea, but once you write them down, then they're available in some sense also to other people. Uh, so the act of creation are much more public on a certain level. Uh, and what is de-emphasized is the difference between, let's say, the creative act of the imagination and the passive act of the perception. This is the emphasize. It says that there is something active and creative in any act of uh, perception, uh, and there's something objective in any act of the imagination. So it creates some kind of a level, uh, a different ways of also thinking about uh, the creative act and very much like put it in this world uh, with objects that have weights and that you move from one side to the other and to create an operation and other people understand how you move stuff and how you build this stuff with your body. Uh, this is like how Robert Morris uh, went from uh, Merleau-Ponty to his early uh, minimalist uh, sculpture, those of you uh, who read uh, the paper. Um, uh, yes. Uh, there's another issue that is kind of interesting uh, about the emotions. Uh, so the, I think that I mentioned it last time uh, when I introduced the topic that uh, at least with Heidegger, there's this kind of interesting idea that uh, when you are bored, for example, when you're bored of everything, uh, think about it. I'm bored of everything. So what, what is me bored of everything? So first of all, what you have to do is to think everything. Right? I mean, because if you don't think everything, you cannot be bored of everything. So, so this is a kind of a way of saying, ah, that's kind of interesting. Intellectually, we cannot think of everything. It's kind of a very contradictory concept. You can kind of prove. Nevertheless, the idea of everything is available for boredom as a topic, which means that in some level, uh, some, you know, attitudes, mental attitudes like that, are perhaps more basic and metaphysically more profound than analysis because they can do things that the thinking cannot do. Uh, it, when you try to, for example, uh, it, try to define, like in set theory, okay, to define everything, you, you immediately see that uh, you get into contradictions because then you say, uh, is everything in itself or not in itself? If it's in itself, then be, you know, without it, it's not everything. But if it's in themselves, then it's not really, because it was there before it became. Anyway, I'm just trying to say that uh, the intellectual operation of putting everything together to one thing that you can have an attitude towards uh, can be very difficult. But on the other hand, uh, when you are anxious, you know, when you have like unfocused anxiety uh, about everything or we are bored of everything. So, so it seems like this frame of mind uh, can do something that the intellect cannot do. I'm not sure what I think about this argument, but I think it's kind of interesting anyway. Uh, I mean, generally, you know, I'm not like an uh, expert in phenomenology. I started reading it relatively recently, um, but I'm just trying to uh, explain it in a way that makes sense to me. And also, uh, as I was saying from the very beginning, the idea is that uh, it's another 
foundation that can do a lot of different things, and one of them is a different way of doing art. That's what I'm, I'm saying, that, uh, uh, that when you get to this level uh, that you understand, you, you become, you uh, question everything, and you pull yourself back, and you're trying to say, uh, I'm not going to try to explain anything anymore, but just to understand what is actually happening in my experience, to kind of uh, describe it to myself in the most direct way. Uh, so uh, when, when you are doing it, then uh, insofar uh, that you can kind of uh, uh, find some kind of a terra firma, like a new uh, foundation, that this foundation can really uh, become the starting point of a lot of different things. And uh, this idea of... Uh, so it's kind of interesting that uh, phenomenology was a movement. Uh, and the first thing that phenomenologists do when they talk about this phenomenological reduction, that's what we are doing now, sitting back and just reflect, letting the experience stay in its own term, not try to explain anything, uh, not trying to think about it as part of science, but really focus on how we see things and, uh, and how we feel. So this is like the first thing that you do. Uh, as a phenomenologist, and the idea is that insofar when you go deep enough and you can really come to uh, the most uh, elementary level that you reduce yourself uh, to a being among other beings, then this you become like a metaphysical uh, being because you are doing it with metaphysics, you know, that's what it means to be. So metaphysics is really be becoming like an amateur metaphysician is like the beginning of a lot of uh, uh, productive, new ways to productively start in, uh, in different direction, things that you got stuck before. Uh, and people took it quite literally. So they were, for example, I, I will bring it up like, uh, like uh, people in sociology and anthropology that were uh, uh, influenced by phenomenology. So there was this guy he called on the routine grounds of everyday activities. And uh, so he, he sent, maybe I'll send you also to do exactly the same thing. So he told his students, when, go home uh, and when uh, your partner is asking you question, don't say anything. Just, you know, remain tightly. Uh, and just see what happens. Now, so of course it creates some kind of an aggression, and then you ask, well, why is there aggression? Then you understand for yourself that uh, a lot of your reactions are connected to some kind of a rules that you never think about, uh, and when you understand people's reaction to when the rules are, uh, uh, are flaunted, then you begin to have like a sketch of how uh, people really behave. So uh, another thing that he told his students is like, when you go home and when somebody asks you a question, answer with another question. Like they ask, uh, wh what do you want to have for dinner? Why do you ask me that? Uh, because I want to do something that uh, we will both enjoy. Why do you want uh, us both to enjoy? You know, to kind of take this. Uh, so this was like another exercise that meant uh, like taking yourself back from the world of uh, interpersonal relationship and try to do a kind of a radical investigation of the relation that is based on stepping back from the psychological and sociological laws that govern it. So, so this was like a way how phenomenology, I, I'll, I'll bring you the, the article at some point, let's speak a, about it uh, more. So, uh, so, uh, so in that sense there was a lot of different types of uh, phenomenologically inspired uh, theories in many different professions. There was also 
uh, phenomenologically inspired therapy that took this state of mind we are talking about and tried to look at it in a special way that can really uh, become uh, not like the damage metaphysical identity, but the damage psychological identity. These things are not the same, but they're not completely different either. So this was another uh, example. And in the field of art, as I was uh, not saying, and that's where you should read this uh, uh, article that I sent you, that it's very interesting that uh, uh, the minim minimalism basically started by people who read uh, Merleau-Ponty, like Robert Morris, and from their point of view, the idea w was to uh, start a, s a sculptural practice, namely to add to the world another being, like a sculptural being, uh, but to do it uh, from, from the very, very uh, reduced perspective that basically takes into consideration uh, the least amount of characteristics and semiotic stuff and pop culture stuff, uh, you know, put all that aside and to really start doing sculpture on the basis of a being moving in the world, like uh, Morris was kind of always like wearing like gloves and he would like take those big, uh, uh, you know, like wooden stuff and kind of move them around. I mean, this was kind of how he, he started uh, doing that stuff. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll return to that, uh, but that is basically my point that on the one hand, the phenomenological movement is really about turning uh, a person who wants to uh, uh, create a new foundation for their identity uh, through this type of metaphysical analysis to really kind of correct themselves metaphysically, but at the same time, this type of the, these ideas uh, became the starting point of a lot of different theories in specific discipline uh, that you all started with this idea of doubting everything and like see trying to map out like uh, the logic of everyday activities by uh, refusing them uh, and then see what happens and then mapping it, etc., uh, etc. Et so uh, there were many ideas of what actually happens to you when you get to this uh, uh, level. What do you have to kind of seek? Uh, and there was a guy, I cannot find immediately, uh, he spoke about the fact of regaining the sense of wonder from the world, is to look at the world with a sense of wonder, that you kind of look at everything as how, uh, how interesting it is the way it is, and how little you have to change it in order to actually experience this basic wonder of being and uh, and uh, this is actually this is how uh, like Robert Smithson when he went to uh, that's the end of the article that I was talking about that uh, uh, Robert Smithson was also reading Merleau-Ponty he went to he left Manhattan and he went to uh, Jersey to New Jersey and he was like looking at this post-industrial landscape of all these rust, rusty huge structures that don't function anymore. And he like looked at the whole thing with a sense of wonder. That was like uh, to regain the sense of wonder uh, as, as a kind of, the, because, so the idea is that it's not like this kind of negative, no, I'll say no, 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 you say yes, no, 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 I refuse. It's not like this kind of, negative thing, uh, you know, attitude like you could think from the way I was describing it, but on the contrary, uh, you put yourself back so you can re-experience re the wonder of the world. That, that was another way, I thought it was kind of neat how uh, it described it. In other words, to really, to feel that your level of engagement and of level of energy, your level of reception and transmission are down because of all that stuff uh, that is kind of disturbs you and that in, already, in, 
in, or, in order to, uh, to counteract uh, these negative aspects that you put back and you kind of feel the surge of energy and the wonder comes back and everything looks interesting. And you, uh, I was kind of thinking about like when we went to the, uh, this area for the project, the Wildnis, uh, how is it called? Uh, uh, Pardon? The Stadt Wildnis uh, near Magdalena, where we do the project. You know, so it's just sometimes enough to like go to outside, and there it kind of helps you because there are no categories. Everything seems to be more or less arbitrary the way it is. There doesn't seem to be much of a rhyme of reason, and that helps you kind of to get rid of a lot of stuff and just to look at stuff with wonder, to kind of bring wonder back. Anyway, that's so. If you read the, I asked you to read the preface of. Uh, of Merleau-Ponty, so you will see it again. Like the, some a guy called Fink, I think, said that to bring back the sense of wonder. Uh, uh, good. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> so uh, yeah. Let's uh, stop here. Uh, basically, uh, I want to talk about three things. As I was saying, first of all, the content of the phenomenological uh, operations that we started doing today. The second question is in which conditions or under which, which situation uh, the phenomenological uh, uh, operation seems to be particularly helpful uh, so that really people have the urge to like move there because it really solved like some of their deep uh, um, problem. And then the third thing is more specifically just to speak about uh, a variety of theories and ideas that really came into being as the application of these ideas to a specific uh, field. Good, thank you. That will be it for today.